Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 76. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today is Kimberly Revia, and we're going to be talking about conventions, about the Granite Game Summit, one of my very favorite conventions. Um, Kimberly co-runs this convention, and uh, she has lots of good ideas about how to run a convention. So I figured we could talk about how to do board game conventions, even though, ironically, everything has now gone virtual. Thanks for being on the podcast, Kimberly. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've been wanting to chat with you for a while on the podcast, and uh, thank you for putting on the Granite Game Summit. Like I said, honestly, one of my favorite conventions. I love it. Always feels so welcoming and awesome. Thank you, thank you. Uh, which uh, I think is, is one of your goals. So, so tell me, how did the Granite Game Summit begin? What was the origin story? So we just actually had our five-year anniversary of the first conversation that spun out to be Granite Game Summit um, just last week, actually. It started from a series of tweets. As many Um, great things are. uh, Yeah, from (laughs) it was about Gen Con housing and the block opening up and filling and all of that. And then Michael, one of my co-founders and organizers, and Kevin, the other one, was like, Hmm. It's too bad we don't have anything locally. Then we talked about Unity, which is a convention that used to take place, a one-day thing once a year, here. And it spun off from there. And then we took that conversation from, it literally went from like, oh, I would not want to be in the shoes of a convention organizer. (laughs) And that same night being like, wait, should we be convention organizers? Strange people we've never actually met before. (laughs) (laughs) So you, so you only knew them like through Twitter at that point? So Kevin and I had met briefly on the way back from BGG Con, literally at the airport flying home from BGG Con at like five o'clock in the morning. I had not gone to bed the night before and I was like deliriously tired and ended up chatting with Kevin at the gate and then on the um, shuttle bus back and forth. <laughs> but that was it. And Michael and I had never met. Michael and Kevin had never met. Uh, so yeah, just three strangers who happen to be Twitter friends. <laughs> the magic of, of Twitter, the, the positive magic, which is rarely seen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Usually when you hear something about Twitter organizing something, it's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I like to say it's the exact opposite of what I tell my children, which is don't meet strangers on the internet. I not only met strangers from the internet, I decided to start a company with them. <laughs> As you do. Uh, so how was, what was the process like for that very first convention? Cause it seemed like, uh, did any of you had a, have an experience with that kind of thing before? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. So we each brought in very different pieces to the equation and we decided we would try a one day event. Our goal was to get 60 people one day, just rent a room in a local hotel, the cheapest one we could get to keep the cost as low as possible, just in case. But we decided that we could each probably realistically bring 20 people in. So that's where the 60 people that figure came from. Um, Kevin is, I believe, a software engineer or a developer and a game designer. So he had some game design knowledge and back end technical stuff, which is great. We actually all have some technical background, which definitely helps. Mike does like community engagement for companies and he's run events and he used to be like a a summer camp counselor back in the day so he has actual like event facing stuff that works well i have like former fundraising board experience that was about it on the event side i just happen to know a lot of people in the industry from twitter (laughs) so i bring that to the table oh and mike knew a bunch of local board gamers because he's been here in New Hampshire gaming longer than Kevin or I have. None of us are from here either. That's the other odd bit. Like, I'm from Seattle. Mike is from just outside of Chicago, and Kevin's from Ohio natively. So Mm -hmm. just a weird mishmash of let's meet strangers on the internet and create a thing. Yeah, so how did that first year go? Because I've been to two of them, I think, but I was not there towards the beginning. Did, Did you get all 60 people? (laughs) <laughs> so we had space for 125 and I was actually in, it was May 14th or 15th, I think of uh, 2016. And the week before the convention, we sold out our 125 tickets 
and there was a wait list of like 30 something people and I was in Seattle on spring break with my kids visiting family we had a for me 5 a.m meeting (laughs) for them 8 a.m before their work day had to start emergency meeting about okay we're sold out and there are like 38 people on the wait list should we extend and get the full ballroom because we were in like a a smaller non-ballroom room in our original venue it's twice as expensive but we can fit twice as many people we decided as a hail mary let's do it this is friday so eight days before the actual event we double our space we double the cost and we still sold out the day of wow so the first event ended up being 250 people and it went well and people came from other states like that's how Lacking, I guess, is the best way to put it for just a board game focused event in our general region was like there are other conventions that are a mishmash of like LARPing and a board game room off to the side and some RPGs and a lot of miniatures. But there wasn't anything that was like here. Mm -hmm. We just come, we play board games, we hang out, mid chill, relaxed, not everything's ticketed, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but people came from like, I think our first event, we had people from five states for a one day event, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, thinking about I mean, there are some other local cons, but you know, they have different tend to have different focuses. The big one, the big con in the area is obviously PAX East, but that well, you know, yeah. it's only like 20% <laughs> board games and, and oh, 80% I don't even think video games. Yeah. <laughs> Although the board game section has grown. Yes. Uh, over the years the first year i went it was just like shoved off to the side but now it's yeah, become thanks. a bit more legit but yeah all, uh, the other local cons i've been to in the new england area tend to have different focuses um yeah. in granite gain some is really seems to be like the convention for people who want to go and just play games Yes, our convention is, do you want to play games and have some cool, unique, geeky experiences? Like, Fancy Friday meets Geeky Trivia, and the final taping of Flip the Tables podcast. Like, we have some unique events that always fill to capacity that people enjoy, but the real heart of what you do at the event, aside from that, is just meet people and play games for three days. (laughs) <laughs> it, is that something uh, that you tried to model off of a, 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 another convention you all had been to? Or was it like trying to fill in the gaps of what you what you wished a convention would be? So basically, we when we met up for the first time and actually met and had like a, a meeting like days after we tweeted at each other, we met up for like brunch and a meeting and it was okay. We each brought an idea of what we thought we would like to have at a convention personally and what we thought the core community building like code of conduct things were that needed to be covered because we all agreed that like a code of conduct is the best place to start. And we just basically compared our lists and went from there. So we're inspired a little bit by BGG Con from me, (laughs) Unity from Kevin and Michael, um, which is the convention that went that stopped and we actually revitalized with reunity recently but uh yeah and geekway because geekway from the west even though none of us have been there i'm friends with many of the people from the panel and i've heard nothing but amazing things about how inviting it is and how safe and great the community is they've been building so it was like a mishmash of those three speaking of the code of conduct i noticed that um at least compared to other conventions, like the code of conduct is very front and center with Granite yeah. Game Summit. It seems to be a, a big priority to uh, make sure people feel safe and are very aware of what the standards are for conduct. And that seems, I mean, I haven't been to many conventions, but I know that obviously there have been lots of different controversies and issues and, and problems that have sprung up at other conventions. Talk to me about how what your efforts are like to try to make sure that that's very open and front and center. So yeah, obviously if we build a convention around our code of conduct, it's going to be a pretty high priority. Uh, we all agreed that when you start with building a community, you have to do so well or don't bother doing it. Right. If you're not going to create a safe, inclusive, diverse community, there are plenty of people who have 
game night in a restaurant or whatever. Let's like stick it to that. Keep that as the thing. Uh, we make sure that our code of conduct is, like you said, front and center on everything. When you buy a ticket, you have to approve it always. Uh, it's part of our Eventbrite policy. It will go out in emails. It's posted all about the event. And we go over it. Like we just, we discuss it a lot. And I think that having such a straightforward living code of conduct, living in the sense that we continually update it and you hear feedback and change what needs to be changed. Um, that having it as front and center as we do automatically curbs a certain subset of people from having any interest. Like they're just not going to come and that's good. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not just that it does like double duty, right? Because yep. the code of conduct itself, you know, establishes rules, but it also is almost like a signaling device that, you're not going to be able to get away with anything at, at the convention. Yes, it definitely does. It just sets the stage for, hey, this may not be for you, and that's cool. Like, we've had the occasional email about people from people being snarky about something on the code of conduct or not understanding or being upset that, I mean, we got one email after we changed our logo to be rainbow colored. And it was like, hey, good news. We're not the convention for you. And I mean, I, we're polite about that, but I was like, here are other local conventions that you should consider instead. If, if the fact that we changed our logo to be rainbow colored is going to be off-putting to you because you're uncomfortable, you don't want to be here and we don't want you here. <laughs> like, right, right. I don't believe that inclusivity, being inclusive means that you make room for everyone at the table. You make room for the safe people at the table and you push back on the people who would be potentially dangerous or bad or harmful to the rest. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how the, how the code of conduct has changed. Cause you mentioned that uh, you've gotten feedback and you've made alterations. Uh, oh, yeah. What are some of those changes? Ooh, let's see. Well, for virtual, we had to have a whole new subset of rules, right? Because everything's virtual. So we had to have things that I had never even contemplated before added in like, Hey, don't pretend to be somebody you're not. Mm. That will not only get you kicked out of VGS, it will get you banned from all of our conventions. Don't be. As I'm sure you know, there are a lot of like troll online accounts imitating people within the community. Unfortunately, this seems to be a thing that's on the rise lately. If you come in and you pretend you're Sarah, whomever, and you're not, you will be banned from everything for life with us. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's just a, a safety point. That we hear from people and go, oh, okay, uh, let's see, what else have we changed? Nothing too major. We've added in, like, um, respect people's pronouns. Mm -hmm. It's usually just smaller things that it's like, oh, you know, we, we actually should include that, right? Now we're putting pronouns on the badges. We should make sure that they're covered, that you have to respect somebody's pronouns. And mm -hmm. we're not saying you have to perfectly get somebody's pronouns correct every single time. We're human. We expect people to be human. We don't expect you to be a troll. Right, about yeah. <laughs> don't intentionally misgender another human being. With the intent of being harmful, we will ban you. <laughs> like, Just be generally respectful. If you mess up, own it, apologize, move forward, try to do better next time. Mm-hmm. And and you said like you've gotten you said you've gotten a few emails and such, but mm -hmm. has there been any major pushback to the code of conduct, or just no, the occasional email here and there? Just the occasional email or Twitter comment. Mm -hmm. Nothing significant. I think that everybody understands. Everybody who is in any way familiar with any of our conventions knows who we are as a company and where our standards come from, and they generally just disengage they don't agree yeah they yeah. try to make their case yeah let's let's shift to talking about the virtual convention because i'm having fun over on the discord server um <laughs> and obviously it's it's a pretty big pivot to turn to go virtual right in, in our strange <laughs> yeah. era in which we live uh what was that decision like was was it kind of like, well, I guess we're going virtual now, or is it like an actually a, like a tough decision? <laughs> so, no, we actually, we were like, you know what? We're not doing it. 
like we've each had significant life flux things in the last year and like Kevin is t- sitting this one out for personal reasons but Mike and I it was a continual like we're just not going to do it we're just not going to have an event in 2021 and that's fine and then I started trying to go to some online conventions to support my friends who are also convention runners and then I ended up being like <sighs> like okay this is this almost hits it but really it should be less about meeting in a digital platform and playing games on TTF at a scheduled time because you're missing out on the community engagement. And then Mike and I had just like an impromptu chat one day and it was like, really what people need is like just a weekend of fun connected shenanigans. Like at this point in the pandemic, most people have some base of a community that they can play games online with people if they're interested in it. Right whether they found those people on Twitter or Facebook or their local game group or their standard meetup or whatever, most people at this point have found that if they want to do that. But they aren't getting that connection with other people outside of that, from people that they they know but maybe not know as well, and new people in general, they're kind of sticking to one core. And it seemed like most board game events that I've attended online were very like, at 11 a.m., we're playing Irish Gage on TTF. We're going to meet in this Discord, and then we're going to go there and play the game. And for me, that does not do it at all. Like, I don't feel connected to other people when I do that. It just doesn't fulfill anything for me. It feels like a chore. Mm-hmm. And, like, that enough so that I started getting interested in RPGs because I felt like they flow a little bit better where you're a little bit more human connected Mm -hmm. (laughs) within your group online and I have never been an RPG person until just recently so and then we were just chatting about that and I was like what if we do just like a weekend just a weekend not the full four days like we were going to do if we were in person right because this year we were expanding to four days but two or three days two and a half days of like here's some cool stuff like some panels or geeky trivia or large group games like welcome to and then we we just chatted about that and then I was like you know what we've all survived to this point that deserves to be celebrated after the year that we've had right <laughs> for most of us <laughs> let's celebrate having made it to this point I think I'm gonna try to run some sort of an event you don't have to join in on this with me if you don't want to it could be aside from you know, G2S, Stumptown, Reunity. And Mike was like, yeah, no, let's do it. And I mean, we were continually <laughs> getting people asking anyhow, and we kept going like, probably not. That's probably not for us. And here we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I found it fascinating to peek into how different conventions are doing their online thing. I haven't attended many because, I don't know, like you, like, the idea of like having scheduled obligations when you're just chilling at home. Yeah. It's kind of a drag. I went to one that was immediately a turnoff. Like I just had to exit. I was like, no, this is very weird. Uh, and it had this whole system where you were in this like digital space with like an avatar and it was like a 16 or eight bit, you know, style graphics. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then if your avatar got within a certain proximity of someone else, both of your uh, cameras would turn on. And then all of a sudden you'd like see a live stream of them and they see a live stream of you. Yeah. And I'm like, whoa, that's very weird. <laughs> and uh, I just went away. I just I, I couldn't do that. That was way too bizarre. Um, I think it's an interesting format that works great for specific things like a vendor hall. Because yeah, it allows which you is, to wander through a vendor hall. Which is what this was. But even then, I'd be like just going around, you know, trying to figure out what different controls are. And then all of a sudden, someone's like talking to me. And I didn't realize who's talking to me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it was, it was very strange to me. And uh, I, I couldn't do that. Uh, although I can see, I don't know, maybe for like a smaller thing that would work. I don't know. That was a very strange yeah. format. 
Um, we are considering it for Designer Alley because it can give you that vendor hall feel so you can just check out people's games and then they can be like, hey, I'm going to teach my game later on TTS. I think it would work better if you if it's an opt-in thing from a larger framework. But this was like yeah. the entire event was hosted in this. And so yeah, there was like, there about. was yeah. no escape <laughs> from like, mm -hmm. oh man, someone could walk up next to me and then see me. Well, it's a that, very strange feeling. At least as a woman, I definitely feel less comfortable with that. Like I get uncomfortable if somebody walks up too close behind me at an actual in-person event. I don't want some mm -hmm. random person to have some sort of video access to me just because we're in the same large convention, which is, I mean, we, we were approached by a couple of companies who offer that service for VGS and I was, or, or a similar service and we were like mm. <laughs> the tech so like the tech overhead is kind of high right it, mm -hmm. it won't run well most people on like a chromebook which especially with this year with everyone remote schooling and, and all of that a lot of people have chromebooks now and the tech just doesn't work for that so the tech overhead is too high it is uncomfortable for a lot of people and for people like me it's just a general like sensory overload right yeah yeah it doesn't um, feel like you get to opt in as much when it's that focus. So we decided really quickly, like, this is neat for certain things and maybe as a piece of the event, but it sure as hell is not going to be our entire event because none of us want this. <laughs> right, <laughs> you don't yeah, want to yeah. be submerged in that. It yeah, I could see it working as everything. a piece of it, right? A thing you deliberately go into as part of it. But uh, in terms of the virtual summit, I love that like you're you're starting early with the Discord server. If you get a ticket, yeah. you get invited to the Discord. I've already attended one of the uh, game events, played a couple really yeah. cool games, uh, which is nice because it's like you know it's like meeting old friends, even if it's like a person I played a game with once two years ago. It's like oh yeah, right. I remember them. <laughs> so I like I like that the virtual summit is kind of like starting early in a set like the actual summit hasn't started but like the community's there i mean our, our goal with opening the discord early is multifaceted but uh, some of it is to start building an online community that is moderated and safe where people can go to just chat with other people that they know and have conversations and yeah we have these we plan to do like a weekly every week or so at least, impromptu game night thing where we either play like Jackbox games or we play games on Board Game Arena or .io games or TTS or whatever that one of us offers to host. And it can be, it doesn't have to be Michael or I, it can be a community member. But that way that we're building an actual community where you can just go to and probably get a better response than you would just tweeting like hey i'd like to play this game at this time so we're creating you know all of those channels and it's continually changing because we're learning as we go <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so we're, we're updating channels we're trying out different bots but the other part of opening it early is to try to get over a tech hurdle before the weekend right mm. so the people who are less comfortable with discord we want you to come in feel your way around and feel like you can connect to the event before the actual events start so that it's a comfort level. Because like you said, entering the virtual 8-bit world was definitely kind of jarring for you, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was weird. Discord, Discord will be for some people, too. So, like, giving that added time of people to come in and ask questions. And, I mean, that's the beauty of our community. They, You guys are already there helping each other figure things out and setting up your own game night and like organizing things and talking about movies or what video games you're playing. And the pet channel is obviously my favorite. Of course. Yes. And send me photos of your animals, please. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't even had half of the people who have bought tickets enter the discord yet. So I'm going to continually try to like encourage Activate your Discord link, friends. <laughs> like, yeah. It's pretty. It's pretty key to knowing how to use the Discord before the event. So mm -hmm. hopefully we can get that in there. But the but we're keeping our Discord server up at least through the throughout 2021, if not longer, so that people can continue to have that safe platform of like-minded people where they can just 
relax, chat, have fun, and play games. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I mean, that's a really cool way to get a community because I've like I think everyone at least people who are trying to stay plugged into the board game world uh right. have a massive list of discord channels that they randomly get invited to i think i counted the other day i'm part of like 14 or something but you know i only pay attention to three of them uh right. and, and it's just it becomes a bit fragmented and already i see like this channel as being kind of a hub for like Oh yeah, these are the people who I know have a fairly similar taste in games, which is also something interesting because, like, you have in, in the Discord channel, there's like the introduce yourself section, and one of them yeah. was like, you say what your favorite game is, and man, everyone has like really good taste mm -hmm. <laughs> in games, uh, which I I can't imagine was like a del like how do you you can't filter for that in no, any actual way. It just happens that everyone, man, everyone's all into these like nice, chunky, medium, heavy Euro games mostly, which is, which is good with me. <laughs> Whatever reason, our region seems to be pretty key for that. Like at our very, very first G2S, I remember walking around the room and being like, wow, there are some like dex games and silly games and fun games. And like medium weight things like Harp is not on the table, but it was also like the gallerist on this table, classic age of steam on that one, brass on that one, Mombasa on that one, and a one day event. And I was really impressed to see people playing so many people, I should say, playing such heavy games. Yeah, I don't think joke. you'll see a, a greater density of Vital Lacerda boxes than at Great <laughs> Game Summit. That's what I was just going to say. <laughs> oh, we yeah? made a joke to, I made a joke to Vital a couple years ago. I was like, basically, G2S is like one room of just your games, always. <laughs> there are so many Lacerda games at any given time being played. It's ridiculous. And eventually, yeah. we'll, we'll lure Vital out when he has something else to do in the U.S., because he's always like, oh my gosh, I see so many. I'm like, yeah, look. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, that aligns with my preferences, so it's, it's a good bonus for me. I don't know how it shook <laughs> out that way, but I guess New Englanders like uh, heavy Euro games. I mean, I I one wonder... of my favorite G2S memories was uh, getting to play Democker for the first time a couple <laughs> years ago. Yes. I remember you guys playing that when Rand brought the whiteboard and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So people could see the the progress of the different the different political parties. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty great. <laughs> see, and I like think like we also have a really big eighteen XX contingent. There are always a lot of people who play eighteen XX games, which generally I wouldn't see as a go to a convention and play a bunch of eighteen at like. Typically, when you go to a convention, that's not a thing that you see much of, unless it's specifically that, the convention for trade games. There always seems to be some dusty room in the corner, right? That's yeah. like the and 18XX yeah. room, and you poke your head in. Yeah, and other conventions, you poke your head in, and it's like the same five people, and they're just yeah. rotating 18XX games. And yeah. I used to be like, man, what is, what's going on there? But now I get it. Like, I could totally right. see myself going to a convention and then playing like 14 hours of 18xx games in a row <laughs> yeah absolutely i don't know if it's just because the three of us tend to be heavier gamers the three organizers so maybe it's partially due to the fact that like the people that we know within the community play bigger games but there's also a lot of dexterity games played at our event so it's like that balance mm -hmm. yeah yeah well and then there's and, also don't you isn't there usually an event with word games right in one yeah. of the evenings I, it's the sunday morning crew yeah or sunday noonish i think they do okay yeah. yeah and they play a bunch of word games so i mean there is variety i was just like i i just find it personally fun that like it just happens to be people who generally like the games. I, I, I tend oh, yeah. To no, there's, yeah. there is an entire variety of games. Absolutely. It's not only heavy games. There yeah. are lots of family games and clicker playing games and dexterity games and party games that get played. But I would say that probably half-ish of the attendees are usually playing heavier games, which is, yeah, always interesting to see. And the ease, which we've seen a lot of on the Discord, right? People talking about, oh, one of my favorite memories is I actually saw this 
person setting up the game that they didn't know how to play. And it's like, I saw somebody saying, I'm terraforming Mars and reading the rule book. So I decided that I would teach them and three, you know, and then I played with these people I've never met before for three hours. And that is where I think our community shines the mm-hmm. best because there are so many people who just will opt into teaching the like, brass or <laughs> terraforming Mars or age of steam to people they've never met before and sitting down and having an absolute blast for two, three, four hours with strangers. And then they continue to talk like they catch up at the next event or they become Twitter friends. I see that a lot. And that's so beautiful. That's for me, that's one of the key, like, ah, look at our people. (laughs) It was a good thing. (laughs) Yeah. And I found for me, convent board game conventions specifically when they're done right and when it's a good atmosphere walk this nice balance between like being welcoming like feeling like you're not going to be judged but also this kind of awareness maybe this is just a weird thing that i feel but uh, especially at like board game and like nerd gatherings that are that are, are at least somewhat comfortable there's also this like group awareness that everyone recognizes that everyone else is probably a bit weird and awkward and it's like (laughs) don't worry about it we're all weird uh and then you can get past that right away yeah it's like that it's like the inverse of like a judgment atmosphere where it's like but it's not like everyone ignores it it's like everyone recognizes that everyone else is probably going to be kind of awkward Right, right. Um, I, I, I mean, I, that's definitely a comment that I get from people personally. It, at larger conventions like BGG Con, people will always tell me that I am more socially awkward than they expect me to be from Twitter, who know me on just Twitter, and then I am more introverted than people expect because I will do the thing for a short burst of time and then you won't see me again. Because mm-hmm. <laughs> I go back to my room and hide and and reset and refresh and chill and then I can come back out and do the thing. But mm-hmm. like I think there's more of a baseline understanding that the large subset of us are socially awkward and the large subset of us are introverts. And there's just kind of, yeah, like you say, a grace given to that, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just kind of like, oh okay, I see you. I hear you. You do you. Hopefully I see yeah. you later. And then, and then maybe the way it manifests itself with me is that I realize that like I don't need to like small talk with like it's perfectly okay to go up and be like, "Hey, do you want to play this game with me?" And then they can say yes, and then we immediately play the game. You don't right. have to go through the like the social graces in a regular yeah. interaction with someone you don't know. Yes, the small talk is. The point where which I'm I find awkward. completely refreshing. Yeah. Small talk is difficult for a lot of people, I think. I don't know what to say to somebody I've never met before. Yeah. I just, yeah, I, I'm not going to be like, what, did you try the food truck? I mean, I've learned to, for our event, have like a handful of questions that I can ask to engage somebody else because I try to be like, the host and go around and make sure that it seems like everybody feels comfortable is the best way that I can think to put it. Mm-hmm. I try to introduce myself to everybody and say hi to them at every show and may, definitely people I don't know or I haven't seen there before or who seem like they may be by themselves. Try to connect them to other people if possible, if they look like they're just kind of orbiting the room or just kind of like wandering in and out of rooms. We try to make sure that they don't just continually wander that they connect with other people because that's what they're there for. Right. But it can Mm -hmm. be overwhelming if you walk into an event and there's 600 other people and 500 of them are are already in in a game. I, it can definitely be a bit much. So. Yeah. Yeah. In, in terms of the, the summit itself, I I think maybe I'm misremembering. I, I recall having a conversation with you once where you talked about how you all are, kind of deliberately being very gradual with how you scale up the conference. Yeah. Um, can you can you talk about that a bit more? Sure. So we have been selling out at our basic size now for the last 
three years, I think, and we had considered <laughs> doubling to a thousand, and instead we just reconfigured our layout, and the hotel gave us slightly more, so we were able to bump from five hundred and twenty-five to six hundred last year um, without overcrowding space, right? Because part of our layout is we want to be ADA accessible, but we also want it to be comfortable. We don't want it to be like you have to walk down a row of 24 tables to get to the end of it. And when you push your chair back, you hit somebody else. Like there's a comfort aspect making things enjoyable. So we don't want to overcrowd the space. But also we don't want to grow too big too soon. Like our size is just, I know we sell out. Our size is just so nice. We can still be so personal and warm and welcoming. I still get to say hi to all 600 people every year (laughs) and meet the new people. And we can answer questions and other attendees will help. Like they see you doing things or seem like you're confused. We'll step in because a lot of our community members have been there for at least one or two other shows. A lot of them have been there since the beginning. Like 250 of them pretty much (laughs) been there since their very first show. And it's just, you grow too quickly, you're going to lose some of that. It'll lose some of that magic. We could probably double in size and still sell out. But at what cost? Mm -hmm. Like, you don't want to make it so that people who would like to attend can never get a ticket because it sells out immediately. But you also don't want it to be too big. You want it to have some space for new people to come in. But really, for us, currently, our largest hurdle is that we love our venue. And venues are are the largest, most difficult piece of running an event like this. And our venue is fabulous. They are absolutely wonderful human beings to work with. It is so clean. The rooms are so nice. The bedding is great. Like, it's just good. And the proximity to food is wonderful, <laughs> which for me, a person who has CBX going to conventions, that's like a, a big deal, right? Access mm-hmm. to food that I can safely eat is right, always right. an uphill battle. And we have such a good location for that. So it's just, it's a multiple piece puzzle that you have to work through. Would we like our venue to be able to fit 750 people instead of 600? Absolutely. But we wouldn't actually want to go from 600 to 1,000. Mm-hmm. overnight because you're just inviting so much space for other things to not even necessarily go wrong but to be not quite us we've been growing small for a reason <laughs> we can control it and literally after every show the first thing that we do when we meet up is we go through what could have been better what should we focus on for next time what can we change because every year we we're able to streamline. I almost said automate, but that is definitely not the case. Streamline things a little bit better so that the workload for us is a little bit less in a lot of areas. And then we can take our attention elsewhere. And it, our intention is always with financial and with our time and energy is always, how can we make this better? So our focus is on improving what we have, not on maximizing what we have. It is definitely quality over quantity. Mm-hmm. And every year we meet after the show and we're like, do we grow? <laughs> do, do we consider it? Or do we stay the same and focus on these things? And every year we're like, I would rather put that energy into making sure that we can do this, this, and this and keep it at this size. We don't sell out instantly. We only sell out like a month before the show. People have time to get their tickets. And yes, every year there we get a slew of emails after it sells out of people being like, I thought I was going to be able to buy it at the door. And we're like, we sell out every year. <laughs> you can show up day of. And sometimes people will have told us, I think you were one of these people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Once I thought I had a ticket, yeah. I was 100% convinced I registered the day the tickets were released. I was so, so- confused when I got there. <laughs> So every year there are like, between when we stop badge sales and and badges are printed and stuff, there are usually like 10 to 20 people who will drop their tickets. For whatever reason, illness, 
family emergency, time means off, whatever reason, who email us and they're like, oh no, they realize I'm not going to be able to make it. So we hold those badges aside for the people who do still show up at the door. So we know exactly how many we have. So we don't oversell because like I said earlier, like comfort is a big thing for us. So we filled in a 20% seat cushion. So we could fit 20% more people with our layout as is in the convention. But then that's assuming that every six top table has six people at it. Mm, That's not realistic, right? Like, I don't expect every 10 top round table in the side room to have 10 people at it. So we shouldn't build it that way. Because I'm sure you've been to events where it's like, wow, I literally cannot find a table. Oh, yeah, yeah. I went to one last year. I'm saying last year, like it's still 2020 and Mm -hmm. 2019. And after lunch, I came back and I literally walked around for like 20 minutes and could not find an empty seat. Um, That's the absolute worst feeling. And I just went home. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I do the same thing. And nobody wants that. So we build in a 20% seat cushion, assuming that not every table is going to be at its max capacity. Yeah. in, In for people, I don't know, anyone's listening who's considering running an event like when I heard twenty, when I heard you just say twenty percent seat cushion, I was shocked because yeah. I always like G two S always seems very full. It is like I've never not been able to find a chair, but it seems like it was like it would be like a five percent cushion. Like if I had no. to guess ahead of time, yeah, yeah twenty yeah, percent. That's that's 20%. pretty incredible. So last year we had six hundred tickets that we sold. We had seats for seven hundred and twenty five people. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the kind of thing, like, I would never, if I was planning a convention from scratch, I would never imagine to do that, to leave that many seats uh, open, essentially. So we, we literally went through and we were like, okay, what are games people play? What's the player count on most of these games? Convention, venue, tables are usually six top. Mm. Those rectangle ones, they sit six people. Most games are going to have four-ish people at them. Most tables. So if we were to figure that out, or if, God forbid, a chair breaks at the last second, or like we want to make sure that there's enough comfort and enough space and everyone can find a table. So we just pulled that number out of trying to do our best guess, and it worked well for our first event, and it still continues to work well. That's and it still really- feels like the rooms are full, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It you, seems you very You can full. always find space, but they're full. So we have the quiet breakout areas that also help with that, right? Like last year, they let us have the quiet alley in the hallway outside of the restaurant, which we get to keep moving forward as well for quiet gaming. And that added like an additional 60 seats for us. And it was wonderful for people, especially we have a few attendees who come every year who have uh, who have hearing difficulties. And so being in a ballroom with 400 people in the main ballroom makes it almost impossible. Mm -hmm. You're relying so much on being able to read somebody's lips and people move and turn. But when you add an alley of quiet gaming, we got so much praise for that last year. So many people were like, oh, my goodness, thank you. Oh, yeah, that's also it's open, right? It's not enclosed like our other breakout rooms are rooms still. So you get that the acoustic buildup of all of the people around you and it just stays where you're in an, a big wide open hallway it's so much better <laughs> when it's 20 feet wide and it's just long and just stays so much quieter everything stays at like a dull buzz in the background noise wise and that's great mm-hmm. and i'm so grateful that the venue was like hmm how do you feel about putting tables here and we were like yes thank you <laughs> if you'll allow that absolutely yeah <laughs> Yeah, that is huge. I mean, I had an ear issue again last two years ago. I don't know. I had an ear issue that where I got like 60% deaf in one of my ears because of some fluid buildup. And Mm -hmm. I was shocked that it wasn't that noticeable in a quiet atmosphere. But like the thing they test you for to figure out how much hearing loss you have. And the thing where it's very noticeable is when there's background noise. So yeah. even for people who have just minor hearing uh, loss, I can imagine a conven- con- normal convention atmosphere is just horrific. Oh, yeah. 
I, I'm sure. And as I said before, I'm pretty introverted and I definitely have a lot of like overstimulation and sensory issues. So for me, having a quiet space that I can go to and actually feel like I can focus on the game is big for me too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it just, it's an element of, I feel like I can relax. Yeah. <laughs> and listen and focus a little bit better. And yeah, that's big. Yeah, that's pretty great. And then like Trafalgar, the small ballroom where the library is, usually ends up being a lot of trained gamers. Mm-hmm. Right? Like there's a lot of 18xx that happens in that room. I wish we had a couple more breakout rooms, but it is what it is. <laughs> and I think that we manage it in that space a little bit better. I wish there were better chair rentals. That's one of our hurdles that we go through every year. Every year we contact like a dozen event rental places to be like, please, please just get some better, not those plastic folding chairs. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Either the plastic folding ones or the like bamboo-ish ones for weddings. That's what everybody locally has. Right. Unfortunately, but every year we go through a thing where we pull up all of the current companies within a hundred mile radius that, that do event rentals and we try because it's just a piece of like, we would love to have better, more comfy chairs for our extra chairs. Cause the ones that the venue provides are great, but they don't have enough. So we have to rent some tables and some chairs every year. Mm-hmm. And every year, it's sad to see that no companies are offering nicer chairs still in the area, but we try. <laughs> we try to make everybody's comfort and accessibility a pretty key priority. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, it's it's noticeable. Like I said, it is it is uh, a fantastic convention. Is there anything that's been like sitting on the the dream list of like something you would love to do but haven't been able to do yet uh, with the convention? Oh, geez. Hmm. Oh, there's probably quite a bit actually. <laughs> Size limitations. Um, we would love to have. The ability to have, which Kevin has worked on building our software out for this, actually. So I think we will before next year. For people to scan the games they use from the library, just as an incentive for us to cull. Just to get rid of the bolts, or not the bolts, but to, to clear our shelves. Because, like, we've expanded, our library expands every year. It's expanded since the last one because there are always games that we get from people at the show, you know, and especially at the end of the show, like they brought games to sell and they didn't sell them. They're like, here. But we don't want to have 10,000 games in our storage unit. Right. <laughs> Continually having to buy. Because again, that takes up floor space at the show. So we would like to stick to, I think we've decided we could have one more shelf than we currently have. That's it. That is where we are capping. Period. Like no, no more beyond that point. In order to do that, I think having a thing where you can scan it would be great so that we know what actually gets played. And the incentive to just walk up to the iPad and scan it is that if you want to play that game again next year, if it hasn't been scanned by anybody over the show, it's probably not going to be there. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. it's, it's got that automatic incentive of like, hey, did you enjoy this? Scan it. The other piece that we've tried to build out in our software a few times now is finding a good way to set up a system where you could be like, I would love to play Kanban at two o'clock. I can teach seats for two more people where it could be non-predatory because unfortunately those things can be kind of predatory for people and where it can be comfort where you can mark and say like, I, I'm in, but also I'm not a somebody who really enjoys small talk. So you'd be able to like mark the group and say like, we're chatty. We're not, you know, like medium level. I'm very quiet <laughs> or like we're incredibly chatty or how competitive they want it to be. I don't know that it's a thing that we necessarily need because there is a decent amount of that that just naturally happens. Like I said earlier, where people are like, oh, hey, I could teach you that. And they just kind of do it on their own. But if we grow, I think that's a piece that will be hindered slightly. So we would love to have some sort of a looking for game, but that is fully comfortable. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want people. I don't want somebody to agree to play eighteen CZ and not understand that it might take them three and a half hours to get to the table and feel like they're stuck because that's not great for anybody at the table, right? So something where you can mark your understanding of the game and where it could automatically pull like the BGG link and be like, here's the description of this game. And the person who's looking for players could say, with the teach, I think it will realistically take this period of time. Mm-hmm. Right. Where yeah. they could fill in some information. And it could just be like a an iPad and a sc- hooked to a screen where you could go and look and then like scan your badge and take a seat. Yeah, that that'd be really cool because there's there's yeah. the the little flag thing system, right? Right. Looking for game, yeah. But I've always found that like once you once you actually find the people and you get all excited to play the game, you forget to t- take the flag down. I've done that multiple times. Oh, people do that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and there has to be someone who like goes around and like steals flags from tables once the game has obviously begun. <laughs> yeah, we try to do that, at, and we try we ask our volunteers to, like, if you see a collection of flags and they're clearly playing the game, please return them to one of the other tables where they belong so somebody else can grab them. Just as the, because we have room walkers are one of our volunteer positions, which is just, like, make sure it seems like everything's going all right. Make sure that it doesn't seem like somebody's orbiting but hoping to play like any of the, any of you encounter that, like just try, we just encourage them to try to have a conversation with the person, see what they're looking for, see if they can help because most of our volunteers know quite a few people at the event (laughs) at this point. Right. Mm -hmm. Like they know 200 people now to uh, to some familiarity and they can try to guide people around. And please, if you see the flag, I mean, they're flipped books now, but if (laughs) you see a table sign flipped book, Please put it on an end table so that people can have them. <laughs> yes. People will also put them under the table. So every year oh, we get more yeah. of them because every year that's the thing. Every year we're like, okay, we should probably add ten more. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're they're flip books, which was Kevin's idea, where it's like looking for player, looking for teacher. And here's the code of conduct. And here's the event schedule for Friday. And here's the event schedule for Saturday. Just like the screens around say thing. I mean, we try to keep the information not overwhelming, but also everywhere. <laughs> you don't want it to be constantly like, pay attention. Here's events. Here's events. I don't want somebody going on a microphone every two hours and announcing the next event. Like That's incredibly disruptive. And uncomfortable for so many people, but like we want to make sure that if you're like, oh, what time does that mini paint tank look proud of? You can just flip the book at your table and see, <laughs> or look at the things taped to the table, or go into the hall and look at the monitors. You know, mm-hmm. and that's a tough balance to maintain because, like, the more I've gone to conventions, the more I realize that I don't really need to sign up for a bunch of scheduled stuff to have fun at right. the convention. Like I realized I can just like sit down and play games, but for, I think for me starting out with, with board game conventions and I assume other people, if there's mm-hmm. so many scheduled events and it's reinforced upon you that there's all the scheduled stuff going on, you get this pressure of like, Oh man, am I going to miss out on the life changing convention experience if exactly. I don't pay attention to these. So that that's a tough balance to strike, I think. It is. So we we try to balance that out by just not having events compete. And we try to have it so that events don't even go back to back immediately, right? Because mm-hmm. we actually have probably like five percent of the people who come to G2S pretty much only go to events. They don't really sit down and play board games. Because they, for whatever reason, some of it is just an introverted thing. Some of it is, I enjoy this geek culture subset of things, but I don't really want to sit down and play a game with people I don't know. I'm like, that's completely fine. (laughs) You don't have to play a game to have fun. So we want to make sure there's a decent amount of events so that people who don't really want to game can stay occupied and enjoy themselves. But yeah, not overwhelming. I, I, like when you go to a show and everything is ticketed in a time and it's like back to back or overlapping, that is incredibly overwhelming for me. Mm, and we yeah. don't want that. We want people to be relaxed and having fun, but we also want you to be able to look and be like, Oh, Hey, right. 
I did want to do that mini think take that starts in 45 minutes. So once I wrap this, I'll probably call it grab some tacos at the taco track <laughs> and not, not start another game because I want to go to that. Mm-hmm. It's a balance. And even with the virtual show, it's like, hey, that weekend is based predominantly around here's cool, fun events. And we're encouraging people to block off time for themselves, not just I'm going to go to trivia. We're saying, hey, <laughs> try to give yourself time. If you want it to feel like a convention, you have to do that thing where you actually allow yourself the gift of time. Go to an event, pop into the Looking for Games channel, go to the, we're going to have more voice channels set up for the actual event. Like the coffee chat one is going to be an actual voice chat channel. <laughs> Grab your coffee well, between events that you're going to or between your game and your event. And hang out with your friends. Or like Brandon Rojas suggested that we do a coloring channel for the Discord where we just have downloadable coloring sheets, which is the thing that we're going to do. And in the mornings, you can hop into the coloring channel and just voice chat with people and, and, and color these cute, geeky things. And then continue on with your day. But give yourself that space and that gift of time. Don't just do an event and check out. Because if you just do an event and check out, you're never going to feel like it. You got that connection that you were looking for, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of the hurdle of online conventions. So we've been very upfront since the beginning and be like, you're only going to get what you put in. Right, yeah, yeah. This is very much, uh, and Mike was like, should we really say that? And I was like, yeah, (laughs) I think we need to be pretty upfront. Just like I think we need to be pretty upfront with the whole, like, it's not going to feel exactly the same as a G2S gaming-wise because there isn't really a way to replicate, replicate the buzz of just wandering through the hall and seeing friends and chatting and then popping into another game. Not quite the same way, but we're going to do our best to replicate it in a, in a virtual realm. But in order to really hit that feeling, that relies a lot on the attendees and their engagement within the community and their engagement within the Discord server. And so far, y'all have been amazing, and I highly appreciate it. Like, I took a snow day from the Daily Puzzle when somebody else put one up yesterday, and that was phenomenal. Oh, I love the Daily Puzzle. Those have been great. <laughs> I love puzzles. So, <laughs> and it encourages, like, it's like a little reward for coming in and checking out the Discord every day, right? Oh, hey, mm-hmm. you can look at this puzzle. <laughs> like, here's some guaranteed content churn, which reminds me I didn't put one up yet today. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I just reminded me as soon as you mentioned, I'm like, oh, I should check after we're done here and see what the puzzle is for today. Well, like 15 <laughs> minutes after we're done here, there will be a puzzle left. I have it ready to go. I haven't All right. Yet. But yeah, and, and I'm trying to now that I see that people are really enjoying the daily puzzle. What is spawning from that is now we're talking about having a scavenger hunt before between now and when the actual event is a Discord scavenger hunt, where we give away prizes of some kind, which obviously they're all going to be digital prizes because I'm not a masochist and I'm not mailing anything to people. That is very I mean, There are smart. people all over the world who are joining in. So <laughs> it's the middle of a pandemic. We're just going to do digital gifts, <laughs> <laughs> digital prizes for things. We're not shipping things. But like, I want to continually encourage people to enjoy the space. And we set the cost for the show to be just if we were to sell, like we did for our very first show, here's what it's going to cost us to birth, to boost our Discord. Here's our hosting fees. Here's the taxes, yada, yada. You know, the the not fun stuff here, right? <laughs> here's what it will cost us. If we only get 75 people to buy tickets, this is where the break even is. And we set it from that. And then from that point, Mike and I, because we wanted to keep the cost as low as possible because that barrier to entry, right? And we also have free tickets for people who can't even afford the $10 or it's just not a time, just let us know and we will gladly <laughs> just get you the experience. Like we're not, we're not we're doing this to make money. We're doing this to celebrate and build a strong online community. We're not in this for profit. And then the money we decided last show, two weeks ago, I think that we also definitely want to be able to pay our hosts. In some way, shape, or form, the people who are, some people are doing like pretty thorough, intensive events for us, but we can't afford to pay them without charging significantly more than $10 a ticket. So we're going to have tipping. 
because oh, we're cool. going to have our hosts drop in their Venmo and their Kofi link and just say if you enjoyed your event and you can afford the tip, throw a couple of bucks at your host because we ran a couple of survey things and people are pretty into that. Like when I do an online, like I do online trivia with the castle pretty frequently, I always tip. I buy my ticket and then I tip because I would tip if I were actually in the restaurant doing trivia. They're still doing a thing. They're going above and beyond. And because they can, we're still, we're fortunate enough that in this we're we're job secure, the adults in our pod, (laughs) and we can afford to. Mm -hmm. But I don't want people to feel like they have to either, because I understand that right now a lot of people just cannot afford anything, (laughs) but you still deserve to have a good time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so people, of that. so people are interested in the virtual summit. Where should they go to sign up? You can go to any of our three websites, but I would go to GraniteGameSummit.com. We considered having a a filter website for it, but again, that just adds to the cost. And now, with the money that we make above, once we broke even, the money from there, we're tip sharing out to our hosts instead. So, which is nice. <laughs> yeah. So, I was like, uh, hey, I don't think we should be making any profit off of this, really. Mike was like, yeah, I agree. And I'm like, all right, can we just split our above and beyond and tip share out to our host? And he was like, I love it. So <laughs> let's do that. And it's beautiful. So thank you all for being able to, you know, promote that for us where we can reward our host and everybody can come in and have fun. Yeah. You deserve to have fun even if you're in a tough spot, especially if it's been a tough and draining for you, draining year for you. You absolutely deserve to have the fun. And in order to do that, it means cost low and tech low. Like you, you can't have high tech requirements because there's a cost affiliated with that. But balance, we're learning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like I, I mentioned before, like I, I think – the thought that you all put into these events and like the intentionality of it uh, really pays off to make events that, that are actually feel uh, uniquely fun and welcoming and, 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 and safe and good and all that, all that good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So again, if, if people listening are interested, since it's virtual, you can be anywhere. It's not even, it's not a local convention anymore. It's a, wherever there is a computer convention, granitegamesummit.com, where you can sign up, hop on the Discord, play the daily puzzles, um, and uh, meet people and, and chat and have fun. I have been very much enjoying it so far. Anything else you want to say about the virtual con? Oh, we are still, we still have space for a couple more events. If anybody has an event idea that they would like to pitch to me, or to us, I should say, you can email us, info at granitegamesummit.com. Come at me with those event ideas. Yeah. I forgot that we can have them beyond like the normal 9 to midnight Eastern because we have people all over. So somebody Mm -hmm. was like, oh, can I host an event that starts at 2 a.m. Eastern? And I was like, I mean, I guess. And then I was like, oh, wait, yeah, no, there's lots of people who have tickets who are not in my time zone. What am I thinking? (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely, that would be wonderful. Yeah, it's run so, twenty four hours. It's global. <laughs> exactly, it's global. So if you want to run an event off hours, I can't guarantee that you'll have the most attendance as you would if it were a slightly more centralized time for U.S. If most of the people are still within the U.S., but absolutely, like which it just opened up our event space more though, which I love. So yeah, come at me with new ideas. If you have suggestions or questions. You can also reach us at G2, the number, numeral two, G2 Summit on Twitter. We respond to that pretty quickly now that I got logged back in. <laughs> <laughs> got a new phone and we couldn't remember what the login was. So <laughs> we had to reset it recently. But now we're good. Good. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, Kimberly. This was super thanks fun. For me. Yeah. Yeah, and I encourage everyone listening to sign up. Like uh, Kimberly said, it's only 10 bucks to attend the summit this year, the virtual summit. Um, and I can guarantee you 10 bucks will definitely be worth it uh, easily. You'll have lots of fun, even if just on the time between now and the summit, playing and chatting and finding games to, uh, to play with people on Tabletop Simulator or Board Game Arena or whatever. 
it's going to be a good time. And then I think I, I've, I've heard of some of the events that are going to be happening at the summit, and I think it's going to be quite fun. Oh my gosh. Uh, so yeah, I highly recommend cool you yeah. register and sign up. It's going to be a good time. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, don't forget to check out the thoughtfulgamer.com uh, where I have all my posts and the podcasts and everything there. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can find the podcast wherever podcasts are, hopefully. And if there's a place where podcasts are and mine isn't, just let me know and I'll work on getting it there. If you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer, where you can get access to all kinds of fun rewards and help us out financially. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye.